So after two unsuccessful attempts to record this video, you guys are getting the Cliff's Notes version. Uh, you know, links for this stats in the description and all that jazz. So I'm not a big fan of the term high percentage for techniques. And the main reason that I don't care for that term is it's a pretty relative term. Um, none of the, the techniques that we see that are successful are actually very high percentage in the sense that they create any kind of intended effect. Um, you know, when we look at general stats, the, uh, the, the KO, TKO rate in, and this is just, these are just UFC stats because it's, it's much harder to find things gathered across the entire sport of MMA. And of course, if we looked at specific boxing, grappling, you know, et cetera, uh, the stats would change slightly. But just in the UFC, what we're seeing is about a third of the finishes are knockouts, TKOs. Submissions are only 20.95%. And that's the, the, like the most sunk in accurate one that I found. Uh, and then decisions make up the other 44%. Uh, so that's a pretty broad spread, which means, I mean, like, if you break it into a three-way pie piece, you have a greater percentage of, of uh, hitting a decision than you do the other two. Um, technically speaking, you do have a pretty significant chance of finishing the fight instead of it going to decision, which I definitely encourage. Uh, but each of those two options is lower than the actual decision individually. So now they don't really determine like oh which strike was was the knockout they just don't seem to be interested in that whoever's gathering these statistics but they are interested in the grappling moves that are finishing and i just picked the top four because the numbers get really piddly after that but uh you know the republican national committee I, rear naked choke uh comes in at 33 percent uh, guillotine comes in at around 18%, triangle around 16, on bar 7. There's, you know, decimal points and stuff in there too, and I'm not going to fiddle with that. But none of those are terribly high percentages, right? What you're really looking at there is things that are just working better than other things. Again, this it's a relativity thing. It's not an absolute thing. You know, if we wanted to look at something... Uh, as an absolute value, you couldn't call anything high percentage if it wasn't over 50%. Like just, just by definition of how percentages work and we're not seeing anything over 50%. So now I picked, I picked a, a fighter just out of the air and uh, I went with GSP, well-known fighter. And you know, at 28 fights, eight of them have been KOs, six have been submissions, 12 have been decisions. So that actually kind of a similar breakdown to up here. Uh, and his striking accuracy, and I, I picked him because I wanted to look at the striking, because I, as much as I love, you know, wrestling, uh, I'm still a striker at heart. And we still don't have good stats on the strikes, but at least we can look at striking accuracy. And Well, he's at 53%, so a higher accuracy, you know, a higher percentage striker, I guess. Uh, but I mean, when you see that breakdown, right, 2,470 attempted strikes, and these are significant strikes, right? Things that actually like would matter, create effect, not little piddly nothing stuff. Um, and then he's landed 1313, which is, you know, your 53%. That's a lot of striking. And even with 1,313 strikes landed, only eight of them have produced knockouts or TKOs. So depending on what you're asking of your strike, man, seems lower and lower percentage to me. Uh, now just as a, as, as a gaffe, I kinda, I, I went and tried to look up who the, uh, the, the highest accuracy striker in the UFC was, and it's uh, Anderson Silva uh, at 63%, like 63 point something, but 63%. Still not terribly high, but it, you know it's ten percent higher than GSP. Um, and I didn't look at the rest of his stats. You can find all of these on the UFC website. Uh, but sixty-three percent. You know, I 
I, I have a problem then, right, with calling things particularly high percentage because within that 63% or GSP's 53%, what you're seeing is not one single strike being thrown, but you're seeing like the whole toolbox of various strikes being thrown and certain ones landing and certain ones not landing. Now, you know, if you compared each of those to how many are thrown versus how many land, you might be able to get a clearer picture, but I still have a feeling most of them are going to be under 50%. We just don't have that data. Or if you have that data, let me know because I'd like to see it. Um, so really, what are people talking about when they talk about high percentage? They're really just talking about the relativity versus other things, right? So what creates... What, what, what creates a, a high percentage strike, per se? All that really creates a high percentage strike is it has to be trained a lot, right? And it has to be trained by a lot of people. You know, the, the sample size has to be large enough that it has shown to be reliably high percentage across a large sample. So we're gonna go ahead and say popularity. Right? So popularity is going to be like the number one key. Uh, what do we have next? After popularity, well, you're probably going to want something that's fairly uh, simple to train or easy to train because you have to put in a ton of reps and something that can be done under stress. So simplicity. Right? Then after simplicity, what are we looking for? Well, magnitude of effect, right? It still has to do something. It doesn't matter how simple it is if it doesn't do anything. So we'll just say magnitude. Right. And then I would say, you know, the last thing that I can think of is risk, right? Risk is a huge one. Um, right? Because if it costs too much to do the move, it doesn't matter how popular, simple, and magnificent effective it is um, if the risk is really 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 too high if the risk is unacceptably high now if you can think of other factors that might go into why something might be you know a high percentage per se please leave them in the comments below but for the most part at least talking in very broad strokes I think this kind of covers why something would become a higher percentage technique if that's the term we're gonna go with so popularity is not really a good one though is it right because popularity just means that it's kind of sunk into the culture of hey this is how we do things i remember reading an interview uh, with jackie chan a long time ago and he was saying something to the effect of uh you know well you can fight like they do in the movies in hong kong because that's how everybody fights but as soon as you leave hong kong nobody fights like that and it doesn't work anymore Right? So stuff that's high percentage in that context stops being high percentage outside of that context. And so we start seeing context dependency. And context, context dependency is not a, not a good measure um, for building a very robust toolbox. There's nothing wrong with context dependency because context is king. Context you know, basically determines who, what, when, where, why everything is happening and, and how you should go about things and what the consequences are and all that. Context is very, very important. Um, I'm not at all saying the context isn't important. You should definitely be paying attention to that. But when you look at, at these things, right, popularity is not necessarily the best judge of why things are the way they are because a lot of times things are it's not broke so don't fix it which i don't think is necessarily the best way to go around things so instead of playing the high percentage game and talking about that and you're not going to get rid of that term and i'm not asking you to get rid of that term i'm just saying understand what it means right it's a relative discussion it is not an absolute discussion so when you're stacking your training and this is really what i wanted to get to and the reason i'm making this video when you are building your training and this especially for teachers when you are building your training, I don't want you to think in terms of what's high percentage because high percentage is going to change context to context. And if, if you don't teach a specific sport that demands a specific toolbox, if you have a much more general practice 
where you're looking at, well, maybe maybe this guy is gonna be a security guard and he needs to be able to use this toolbox in a certain way and this guy's gonna be a competitive fighter and he's gonna use the toolbox in a certain way and well, this girl over here is just worried about self-defense and well, she's gonna to have to have the toolbox act a little differently for her. Then you need a more robust way to look at things than just, well, what's a high percentage move? Because understanding high percentage, it means having to understand a lot of context and the fact is all of us have a limited toolbox and trying to apply the wrong tool to the wrong context, which is what a lot of people end up doing, uh, ends up getting us in trouble. And then all of a sudden the culture, you know, just the overall martial arts culture goes, well, your toolbox doesn't work. Now there's probably nothing wrong with the toolbox. You're probably just applying it wrong. You don't bring an automotive toolkit to a carpentry job, right? You're not going to frame a house with a socket wrench. Uh, so instead of high percentage, what should we do? I've got a word for you. Let's just check it out. Tolerance. Tolerance is a term that they use in engineering, and I'm not an engineer. I don't necessarily, I don't claim to understand all of that stuff, but tolerance is a, a big deal. Things often have high or loose tolerances. When they can absorb a lot of variation without the system or the structure failing. Okay. So high or loose tolerances allows a lot of variation without failure. That's a really good thing. Unfortunately, most things have a limit to how much tolerance that can even be built in before they just don't function, right? Because if the tolerances are too high or too loose, you actually lose function. So there is a limit to this. and you go down to low or tight tolerances. And a good example of this is thinking about the AK platform versus the AR or the, you know, the, the M16, M4 type platform. Um, the, the AK-47, AK-74, whatnot, um, tends to be considered having fairly loose tolerances, whereas the, the M4 uh, or the AR uh, has fairly tight tolerances. And what we see in, in that world is basically that you can kind of be a nitwit who doesn't take care of his gun very well and your AK will still work pretty well for you because that's how it was designed. Kalashnikov designed it for a, a poorly trained, you know, conscript army that wasn't going to take care of shit. Um, you know, so things are overbuilt, they're robust, but it's a little heavy, it's not the most accurate, but it does a lot of damage. It's it's good, it's reliable, it just, it could be better, but it's really good and it's reliable, right? So you, again, you can see there's that, that limitation because the loose tolerances also mean you lose things like accuracy. Now the tight tolerance is nothing wrong with the M4 platform and the AR platform, but you have to clean those things more meticulously. They're a little more susceptible to fouling. They're not quite as overbuilt, the, you know, they're lighter weight guns, you know, they don't shoot as heavy of a round, blah, blah, blah. But it's a perfectly fine firearm and is an extremely popular platform. And those are two very, very popular platforms. Um, you know, one is higher performance, higher precision, and another one is more reliable um, and, you know, for lack of a better term, less expensive. Uh, and I don't necessarily mean monetarily, I just mean in total. And so if we start thinking about our training in terms of this, if we start thinking of building our techniques in terms of this, you're going to have such a better time organizing your training from, you know, from beginner uh, to advanced.
right? Because you're gonna be able to stack things in such a way, right? And we can still look at the simplicity of a technique. We can look at the, uh, you know, the, the, the magnitude of effect. We can look at the risk, right? Because essentially what we're trying to do for the very low level guys, right? They don't have enough training yet to be very effective in a fight, which means that they need something that's gonna be fairly reliable because they haven't had the time to build up the skills yet. So you need to build in kind of dummy proof, kind of dipshit, kind of basic techniques. And I, I'm not calling anybody a dipshit. I, I just, I, I don't want to under, you know, undercut, uh, you know, how important this concept of, of simple reliability is. Your baseline should all be like the most reliable, easy to train stuff because the faster you get somebody a baseline of, hey, I can move, I can generate power, I can, I can do these things and still come out on top, the more you can get to the tight tolerance stuff that is more advanced, that's more complicated, that's a little riskier, that um, you know, just takes more precision, that the margins on the page are a little tighter and you don't have as much room for slop. That stuff should always be reserved for the more advanced guys. So, you know, stacking things in terms of this and really thinking about this term, tolerance, as opposed to what's high and low percentage, I think you're gonna have a much, much better time organizing your training. And even if you're not a teacher, just organizing your training for yourself, deciding where to put things in your training, where to put things in priority, where to spend your time on your repetitions, um, you know, where to spend your time on your conditioning and whatnot. This gives you a better guide than this idea of high or low percentage, uh, because truly anything can become high percentage by the numbers that we saw. Anything can become high percentage if you train it well enough to just perform well in your hands, in your context. But high and low tolerance are slightly more absolute terms, uh, because you know, joint angles and uh, body mechanics and, you know, timing and things are a little more general as opposed to being so specific, right? And that's even another kind of thing here for the tolerances, right, is more general, more specific. That can be an important way to look at organizing your training. So that's all I wanted to say. Hopefully this time we got it all out and everything's good. So I will talk to you guys next time. Good journey. Thanks for watching. If you want to buy a t-shirt, please do. I don't make a ton of money off of these, but I kind of like the designs and I'd like to see more people wearing them. Um, you know, yes, this is repping my school, but you don't have to be a member of the school to join. You like the videos? The shirts don't confer any type of rank or anything. You're not. You're not going out and telling the world, oh, I trained there. It's just like, hey, I like the information, I like the training, and it's a cool shirt. All right, guys, good journey.